Hi, hi everyone, delighted to be here. Uh, so, uh, we are here to talk about what makes Broadway uh, the best. And I would suggest to you that we'll, what will make us the best is if we continue to expand what we consider Broadway and what can happen on Broadway. So, most people, when you say, what is theater, what is the theater experience, most people will tell you it's about going to a building, going inside to an auditorium, sitting in seats bolted to the floor. You arrive with friends, but once the show starts, you're not allowed to talk to each other. The lights go down, you get handed a program. Then you're either deeply moved or maybe you fall asleep. And when the experience is over, you're asked to leave. That is what most people know of as theater. And I am here to tell you that is not what theater has been in its history. And for me as a director, I've looked at theater history for inspiration. So let's talk about classical Athens, 5th century BC, one of the great heydays of theater. Uh, theater then was civic, religious, social, political. It was all festivals. So you had Aeschylus versus Sophocles versus Euripides. You had these playwrights out on the street corners of Athens on their soapboxes presenting the arguments of their play in advance. Why? To win votes. Because in classical Athens, all of the theater were festivals where you voted on your favorite tragedy. So actually, Greek theater is closer to American Idol of today than it is <laughs> to what you experience when you go to see a Greek play today. Uh, you go to the show, you have the statue of Dionysus paraded in the theater. There's the front row seat reserved for Dionysus. Uh, and you see a show that involves people from the community, right? Everyone in Athens was part of the theater. You had volunteer uh, choruses, kind of like the Olympics. If you watch that closing ceremony, you saw those hundreds of kids that are part of the theatrical experience, making it part of the city, the country, the entire civic experience of theater. And you got a prize. So when you were voted on as the best tragic play, right, what did you get? A giant bull. That was one of the prizes back in fifth century Athens. And at the end, you were never sent home having seen a tragedy. So if you imagine seeing Medea, play where a mother is killing her children. No, you would not be sent home after seeing that play. You would have a satyr play, right? They were thinking about the audience's experience. So you would not be sent home on that note. You'd see a satiric, fun play that is uh, satirizing and uh, comedy and has music and dance, and that's how you were sent home at the end of your theatrical experience that often spanned the whole day. Uh, let's also talk about 19th century opera, right? Because we think about theater and we don't often think about it as a social experience. So the 19th century opera house, I'm always obsessed with this, is a beautiful environment, much like our Broadway houses, right? You go inside, you see the gold angels and the gold leaf and the beautiful chandeliers. Why? Because you went to the opera house in the 19th century to be in your environment. You dressed up, the lights were on before Wagner put us into darkness because we wanted to be seen at the opera house. The 19th century opera house was the nightclub of its day. You were there in the orchestra kind of making eyes at someone in the box, socializing, flirting while you were watching an opera. This was part of why people went to the theater. So I think we can open up that def definition. I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, my first Broadway show, Hair. Uh, that was a show that when we decided to go to Broadway, I said right away, we cannot take the show to Broadway unless we allow at least 300 audience members a night to come on the stage. And this was, you know, maybe that's not going to be possible. Well, thanks to our uh, dear partners and enlightened producer Jordan Roth at Jujamson, they agreed. And we had audience every single night come on that stage. And guess what? That show went out on a national tour. A tech writer went in. Every venue we went to across America, audiences went up on that stage. And actors were permitted to go out in the auditorium and climb through the seats. So just when you think those things can't be possible, they can. Uh, one anecdote about hair. About uh, six months into the run, I had a friend email me from Washington, D.C., and he said, you know, Diane, it's kind of a shame. We were so moved at your show. But when it was over, the ushers were screaming at us to exit to the left. And it kind of ruined the experience. 
And I thought, oh my God, you know, as artists, we work so hard. We put years, blood, sweat, and tears into making this event on stage. You know why? To transform the audience, to let something happen after the event. And I get it. I see the ushers. They've got their pocketbooks on. They're looking at their watches. They want to make their train to get home. But I picked up the phone as the director of the show, not as a producer, as the director. And I called Jordan. I said, can't you just tell the ushers, give us five minutes. I'm not even asking for a half an hour, five minutes to let that audience have an experience after the show. So I encourage us to think about theater not as just the two hours traffic on the stage, but what happens before, during, and after, because that is all a part of the audience's experience. So now I'm going to show you um, some pictures of the work we're doing up at the American Repertory Theater, where we have put an intense focus on audience engagement. And they might inspire you for some ideas of how you can take these ideas to Broadway. This is a picture of the donkey show. That's what it looks like. That's our second stage called Oberon. It's a nightclub theater. And uh, I had to convince the Cambridge City Council that this actually is a theater. And the uh, talk I gave him was about Shakespeare's Elizabethan England's Globe Theater. This is what it looked like. It was much more of a mosh pit than uh, a traditional theater. The action starts outside. Uh, I encourage us to think about how can we think about the experience outside. So we have characters on the street that greet the audience and bring them inside. And of course, that's the dance floor. So you can sit in seats, or you can actually stand and have an experience on the floor. Uh, to me, closer to Shakespeare's Globe Theater than uh, perhaps a Shakespeare play's experience when you sit in an auditorium like you're sitting today. Uh, Sleep No More, we premiered at ART. I'm sure many of you have seen this. Very much breaking the boundaries of theater. Audience wear masks, wander into rooms. Uh, it's sort of theater meets video game meets theatrical uh, installation. And uh, I'm here to tell you that this show drew more audience at ART than any other show prior to uh, this production. And why? Because it challenged the audience. Sometimes we think in order to have a hit, we have to like dumb it down. No, what happens is an audience goes crazy when they can't get it. They feel challenged. People come back three, four times to see the show. And in fact, in Cambridge, we had people trying to break into the stage management office to steal the books to find out how the show worked. <laughs> so it was actually making the show challenging for the audience that drove the audience crazy. Uh, Best of Both Worlds, gospel musical where we partnered with gospel churches and choirs all over the city of Boston. There was a volunteer chorus every single night, much inspired by the Greek festivals. So the theater's not just artists, it can be the community participating. Can we do that on Broadway? Maybe. Uh, very different kind of show. One man show, Buckminster Fuller, great thinker, inventor of the geodesic dome. What I loved about this show is after the show we had events, art exhibits, uh, areas for children to make art. And my favorite thing, someone started making snowballs in the shape of geodesic domes, and they left them outside the theater, on the benches, in Porter Square. To me, that's great theater. It inspires people to make their own art. Uh, Ajax, Sophocles, uh, tragedy. Again, a use of community chorus, this time by video. So uh, uh, Sarah Benson, the director, had an idea that the chorus would be people from the community, taxi drivers, shop owners, Harvard professors, vets, students, and they participated as a, uh, a video chorus in the performance. Uh, Prometheus Bound, uh, another uh, tragic play done as a uh, uh, political protest play. We partnered with Amnesty International. We created something called Act Two, which was after the show. People stayed and had an opportunity to talk to Amnesty volunteers every week. The production was dedicated to a different prisoner of conscience around the world. And people could stay and learn about the show. But I'll tell you, I had to tell my theater that this wasn't the post-show experience. This was act two. Because once you call it a post-show, people start thinking, well, how long does it cost to, you know, how long is it, how much is it going to cost to keep the ushers? No, it's part of the experience. It's, it's as important as the actual theater event itself. Uh, the Gershwin's Porgy and Bess, uh, what I wanted to say about this is we really made an effort at ART to make the show accessible to all audiences, under-resourced families, kids, and the program was so successful that the Gershwin estate, when we came to Broadway, were inspired and subsidized Wednesday matinees for pu uh, public school children from across New York City. So that, done at a not-for-profit regional theater, could be modeled and brought to Broadway. 
Wild Swans, a uh, production based on Yung Chang's uh, novel about the Cultural Revolution in China. Uh, we also had a community memoir that went with this using uh, Ziga Platform, which is a technology coming out of the Meta Lab at Harvard, where audience members could build their own story and narrative out of their own immigrant um, uh, experience, use social media, and post it on this platform. So another way to continue the experience. Woody Says, a show about the great uh, Woody Guthrie, and what I loved about this, hoot nannies after every show. This was my fantasy of like, how do you keep an audience engaged afterwards? This show, more than any other, hundreds of audience members staying every night in our lobby. And eventually, audience members started bringing um, spoons, washboards, guitars to the show, tucking them under their seats just because they couldn't wait afterwards to play as a community. And then the artists would come out and join them, and we'd have different folk artists come and join on different nights. So to me, a complete event after the show that was as exciting for an audience member as the show itself. Uh, Pippin, I just had to put a slide in, because how could I not here at TEDx Broadway? Um, uh, very proud to have brought the whole acrobatic world, again, breaking the boundary of what can be theater. Can we have acrobats standing on their heads singing a Broadway chorus and have a Broadway musical with acrobats in it? I think we can. This is the show we're currently playing called Witness Uganda, which is about an African-American who goes to Uganda to do aid work uh, and discovers the operation uh, he volunteered for is corrupt. So he ends up uh, befriending some local teenagers and ends up founding a not-for-profit uh, to fund these 10 teenagers in this small village outside Kampala through high school and college. So this is about an artist who actually left the theater to do aid work and then found his way back to the theater because really he felt the theater could help uh, get the message out. What interested me about the show, not only is the music a knockout and the story is a show we don't normally see on in the musical theater, uh, but they really were committed to dialogue. So we have what we call in this show Act Three, because it's a musical in two acts, so we call it Act Three, which is a discussion after every single performance where audiences stay and they talk with the authors. And Matt and Griffin, the co-creators, were committed to that. An unbelievable opportunity in the live theater to actually, as an audience member, have a chance to talk to the creators, right? We all know that phenomenon at the stage door. That's what makes the theater unique. You can actually go and see and meet the people who are in the show. So this is a, an experience of two creators who are committing every single night to greet the audience. And we curate it. It's 20 minutes, no longer. We have special guests come. And I'm telling you, three to 400 audience members a night. It's a small house. It's only about 500 people. A majority of the audience is staying every single night for Act 3. And that's what they're talking about on social media. That is, as, again, as much of the experience of the show is this post-show discussion where they get to engage and ask questions. Uh, we also did an educational tour uh, in advance of the production. Let's not think about educational outreach once the show's on. These two artists went out in October, four months before they began rehearsals, to go into all the school systems to talk to kids, to get kids involved and interested in the show in advance of the production. Uh, so that's a snapshot of the work we're doing at the ART. I just want us uh, to think about theater in a way that embraces the audience as a partner. And I'm a great believer in the audience. I actually think an audience wants to be challenged. They want to think. We want to learn. There is a human need to learn. There is a human need for ritual. What is ritual? To go through an experience in time together. That is what the theater can do. There is a human need for magic. You're going to hear from a magician later today. What is magic? Transformation. All these things. It's spectacle. There's a human need for spectacle. But what is spectacle? I would argue spectacle is a moment of awe. When you go to a mountaintop and you look at a vista or you're at the, at the beach and you look at the ocean, spectacle is putting yourself in the presence of something larger than yourself. These are all things that the theater can fulfill. And what would be better than to create a the theatrical experience where all of these needs are felt, are met? Uh, ritual, magic, the need to learn, and of course the need for empathy and emotion, which is uh, at the core of the theatrical experience. So um, my 15 minutes is up. Thank you very much. I hope this will inspire you. Mm -hmm.